many here have heard of spoon plugging? Wow, all right. Good. At least you, you know you've heard the term, so that's, that's a good place to start. Uh, I've been a member of this club for about two years now, and one of the things that I really appreciate from the club is that the fact that the members share their, their knowledge and their information. And uh, that's really impressed me, and I think that that's, that's what spoon plugging tends to uh, uh, recommend also, that we share our information. And so I've learned an awful lot from members of the club, and hopefully tonight I can share uh, a little bit of what I know that might help some of you others in addition. Uh, first of all, uh, Jack Clark, uh, would you, could you explain in uh, the, the junior tournament uh, this past summer, uh, uh, Jack Clark got a couple of walleye with, with his, uh, in his boat, from his boat. He was driving the boat. And I'd like to have Jack just make a few, mention a few words about what he did and how he did it uh, using spool plugs. Well, I was just out to the ramp there. There's a bar that runs out and down the side and there's a 12-foot brake line on it. And I had my grandson in there. He's good with a spoon plug on because we troll the river all the time. And uh, what I do is I let, I tighten up the drag enough on so that he has to pull the line up so it doesn't free spool on him. And uh, we just, we trolled that 12 foot brake line with a 100. I think we were using 100 at that time. And I just watch his rod and when his rods would start bumping the bottom and I just move out a little bit and then come back. And uh, he caught the first one right off the end of that bar. We made a couple more passes on it. And I said, well, let's go try something else. So we took off to try something else. And he said, Grandma, let's go back where we caught the first fish. Which, you know, these kids are out of this world. He <laughs> said, so OK, let's go back. And uh, we caught the second one. And we did the same thing. It was on a 12, that 12-foot 12 break line. But all of them came right off from the end of that bar. I think most of you guys know where it's at. Everybody goes over. <laughs> Everybody drives by it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right there where the big buoys are, but it's a little bit off to the east of that. But let me tell you this. He runs wire. I had him running wire on Muskegon Lake because we were fishing for, we, we decided, I decided to go to after some northerns a little deeper. And he would sit right there and he'd pull out that line and he'd get it down where it was bumping the bottom and then we'd just move the boat back in and out along the brake line, and he handled it. I never touched the rod. How old is your grandson? He was nine years old today. Good for him. And you know what? In the Grand River, it's awesome. You can go out there and catch five or six bass in spoon plugs by just trolling the holes. And I let him read the depth finder. I said, OK, now you're, are you going down the hill or are you coming up the hill? And he'll go along and he'll start following the brake line. So it's amazing what they can do. Of course, it's a tiller and it's, a, it's not a big boat. Uh, he has a big time with that. In fact, he doesn't know anything else. <laughs> uh, but he does, he, uh, and that, of course, that was a big thing for him. Okay. Thank you, Jack. And then we had another. Uh, Jim Van Assel, I believe, uh, yeah, got a walleye and uh, spoon plugs. And uh, Don, Don, you got a nice uh, salmon out yeah. in a big lake, didn't you, on a spoon plug that no, day? No, we were just in Muskegon. Or in Muskegon Lake? Got a nice salmon there. So they do catch all fish, basically. And uh, what, uh, what I wanted to try to do is to uh, allow you to understand what, uh, how, how much this Buck Perry's material permeates uh, fishing today. And uh, <clears throat> the In Fisherman TV show on February 2nd, I don't know if any of you saw that, uh, <clears throat> was uh, I got a few excerpts here that I'll read that just kind of explains uh, how much, uh, how important uh, Buck Perry's material is uh, for all of us, really, even though we may not use the term or the name or, or that. Uh, of course, Al Linder started. Uh, in fisherman, and he started out as a spoon plugger, and then and uh, 
and his material and the in-fisher material still has the foundation of Buck Perry's material in it. Uh, this is uh, some excerpts from the TV show. <coughs> Excuse me. When you start talking about classic fishing theory, the most fundamental of all theories in fishing is structure fishing theory as Buck Perry introduced it in the late 1950s and early 60s. And that idea, the structure fishing idea, was not only revolutionary for its time, it's revolutionary today. It is fundamental to everything that every fisherman does, whether you are fishing for largemouth bass, muskies, or other species. Perry expressed his unique fishing concepts in his book, Spoon Plugging, which was copyrighted in 1965 and is still available today. Perry was the first to talk about structure, defining it as a portion of the bottom of, the, of a body of water that was decidedly different from the surrounding area. So a bar, for example, is structure. Fish, he said, are attracted to and relate to structure, subsequently using unusual features on a structure to travel from one area to another. These unusual features may be distinct break lines or drop-off areas, but they can also be cover elements like a patch of weeds or a bunch of boulders. So as anglers, we need to search for structure first, then fish cover elements on structure in order to find fish, not the other way around. Too many anglers today cast to every cover element they see whether or not the cover is located on good structure. Perry was also the first to discuss lure speed and depth control, saying the two most fundamental elements in getting fish to bite were number one, its depth, and number two, its speed. All other elements, lure design, shape, color, whether or not it's scented, are always secondary to its depth and its speed. Perry, needless to say, was a theoretician ahead of his time a theoretician for all time, and too many anglers today don't know the man, his mission, or his message. That, that's from the TV show. And tonight I hope I can give you a little bit of his message and uh, possibly it'll uh, help you uh, maybe get into a little bit more. His book is an excellent book on all of fishing and uh, basically all species. Tonight I'm going to talk about three subjects. Bas first of all, basic movements of fish understanding how fish move. Uh, number two, I'd like to talk a little bit about presentation of spoon plugs. What do we do when we present spoon plugs? Uh, how do we present them uh, to help us uh, in our fishing? And then number three, at the end, I'd like to make a few comments from uh, Mr. Perry's book, uh, comments about walleye that he puts in the book. Basically, as spoon pluggers, we fish for all species. But there are differences in the species. And so what we do is we, we note those differences, and then depending on the water and the structure and that type of thing, we can take that into consideration. That includes depth and speed control as well as the environment also. Uh, well, first of all, let's see here. <clears throat> I want to say I'm no expert or super fisherman. Uh, fishing is a lifetime learning process, and there's always more to learn. And uh, this, we have to keep learning and uh, educating ourselves about what we do uh, to improve ourselves, basically, or we'll stagnate. And I just hope I can help you benefit from some of these, some of this information uh, on spoon, yeah, spoon plugging. Uh, first of all, what is spoon plugging? It was started by, began with a serious 16-year study by a college physics professor uh, named Buck Perry from Hickory, North Carolina. From 1928 to 1944, he determined fish behavior relating to their environment and how best to catch them. Spoon plugging is a total concept for successful fishing, all species and all waters. It's the understanding of fish and how they react to their environment. It's an orderly and precise manner in which to fish. Now knowledge is the main ingredient in spoon plugging. It isn't buying spoon plugs and running around the lake lickety split. It's the knowledge that Mr. Perry has in his book that's the main ingredient. This knowledge gives one confidence to eliminate shortcuts and magic lures. It requires no special talent. Spoon plugging emphasizes an unselfish attitude and the conservation of the resource. Fishing and that fishing is a family recreation. Uh, now, does spoon plugging work? Uh, Yes, all species in all waters. It's been proven in Canada, uh, United States, Mexico, and other countries for over 50 years. Uh, I'll start by showing some slides here. And let's see if I can turn that on. There we 
we go. What are we after? Uh, basically, all kinds of fish. Uh, <coughs> We, uh, of course, enjoy pike, and we're after big fish. We like to we like to catch uh, the good size fish, uh, the adult fish. Uh, bass. Well, these bass are all from within an hour drive of Grand Rapids. That's a, that's a member of our club here, and uh, we we catch some pretty good bass from around this area. Uh, this smallmouth. Uh, this happened to be from Mono Lake. There's some good uh, smallmouth in Mono Lake. Of course, Macintosh was one of my favorite ones. Uh, got into a school there. I only landed two of them, but they were good-sized fish, and I had several other ones on. When you get into a school, these fish are active, and you got to get a, uh, a process in which you can uh, uh, present lures to them in a hurry. Walleye. Of course, you guys are interested in this, and, and we are too. We enjoy catching walleye just like as any other species. Uh, this was a nine pound walleye caught out of Mona Lake at the five foot weed line, uh, running at 250 spoon plug, which goes six to nine feet. Oh no, I'm sorry, it was a, it was a 400 spoon plug, which goes four to six feet. He's running at the five foot, the base of the brake line. He was running about six to seven miles an hour in the middle of the day. <coughs> you caught this fish. So they can be. That doesn't mean that that's the only way you catch them. But they can be caught in other, in other ways. And that's, we were checking our depths and speeds. And so sometimes in, in darker waters, uh, the higher speeds are very important. This one was a six and a half pounder out of Reed's Lake. It's, it hasn't very, got many, very, very many walleyes in it. But I, once in a while, I happen to cross one. Uh, coho salmon. Now, all these fish weren't caught on spoon plugs. Uh, they, we use the knowledge of Buck Perry in controlling our depth and speed to catch these fish. We can use jump lures, jigs, whatever. But we do use spoon plugs a lot. It's our basic tool. But that doesn't mean that all fish we catch are on spoon plugs. King salmon. Uh, steelhead right out of the Grand River downtown. Catfish, caught a lot of catfish. One of our club members, how many was that catfish that uh, uh, Bob Hunt caught this past summer on, on the Grand River? About 20 pounds, 18? 20 pounds. About 20 pounds. Caught it on an artificial spoon plug and just a humongous fish. And more fun catching. We love to catch big fish. Uh, this is from Hickory, North Carolina. This is not from around the air, but that's a, a monster striper. Hmm. Uh, musky, this is caught not. Well, caught up in the Intermediate Lake area. Um, and this one was also caught in Intermediate Lake. That was a 36-pounder. Biggest fish I've ever had in my bowl. Uh, white bass, lots of fun. You get into a school of white bass, and they're all over the place. They're fun. Drum out of the Grand River. Makatawa has a bunch of drum in it. Uh, and they're fun to catch. We really, we have a ball with them. And they'll catch, they'll hit an artificial lure. Most people don't realize that. Uh, basically, it's depth and speed. Now, they won't always... You all know that. <laughs> so, most Carl's people will, will take a look at... <laughs> they won't think that they will, but they, they do. And here's another one that will hit an artificial roar. Uh, that, was out of the, that was out of the Holland uh, Channel. And notice that's a 700 spoon plug right in his mouth there. I caught him on wire line in about 25, 27 feet of water, bouncing bottom. And uh, my scale went to 25 pounds, and, and he went past that. I don't know what he was. But there, I tell you, that was fun. That was a fight that I'll never forget. And kids, you know, that's one thing I think is great about this, this club here, uh, that they encourage kids. This is my little nephew, uh, my niece's little boy. I think he's about six. And you can, with the nice thing about the spoon playing equipment is you can take... Uh, the trolling rod, and they can brace that right up against the side of the boat. And you put them on fish. You control the boat. And uh, they, they just have a ball. The kids, the kids go wild. They just love it. And my daughter started at five years old. She was catching 10-pound pike. And uh, I think I spoiled her, really, because now she won't, doesn't want to go unless I can guarantee her fish. I don't always do that. But kids love it. Kids love it. 
And the outdoor writers, this is Bob Witt, uh, and many outdoor writers are very much aware of what Buck Perry talks about in the, in the uh, information in, in Buck Perry's material. Am I in the way? Can you see him down here? Excuse me. Uh, and one of the fun things about spoon plugging is that uh, you can take a friend out, somebody that doesn't really fish, or somebody that's really frustrated in their fishing, and they just can't seem to get any fish, and you can take them out and catch some just decent fish, and they're just thrilled to death, and uh, they love it. And you can do it easily, and all they have to do is hold the rod there. You put them on, you, you study the structure, and you know how to present the lures. Uh, there's just lots of, lots of ways, a lot of fun that people can have. Now, this is a Terry O'Malley, who was the uh, director of the uh, Buck Perry Spoon Plug Training Center down in Hickory, North Carolina. Tremendous fisherman. He was back with Buck Perry in uh, 19, uh, the 60s when they came up to Hess Lake. And they caught a bunch of fish then, got in Michigan outdoors. Uh, it was a long time ago. He's, he, was been, he was with them for several years, and now he's back with them, and, and uh, mainly the director of the training center. This is another instructor from Indiana, John Bales, an excellent fisherman, really knows his structure and, and structure fishing. This is the... Uh, the plaque, and it's located at the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame in Hayward, Wisconsin. This is the highest honor that they give. Uh, this plaque was made out for Buck Perry. So he's, he's right up with the top of them. This is Mr. Perry himself. Uh, this was in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee recently, uh, a couple of years ago. He's 86 years old now, and he still runs Buck's Bays down in Hickory, North Carolina. And he is the, the editor of the National Spoon Plugger newsletter still. And he writes, it's the only publication he still writes for. Um, and it's, it's an excellent publication. There's a lot of good information in there. And on the back of this, I've got some handouts up here. One on the uh, uh, Spoon Plugging Basic Guideline and one for basic movements. Uh, on the back of that one is an application if you're interested in getting the publication. Uh, it's just once every other month. And, uh, if you are getting into spool plugging, it's a really excellent publication. This is the basic guideline. And let's see if I have a pointer. Excuse me. Let's see if I've got a pointer in here somewhere. I don't think it's in the bag. What is that? Oh no, I got it. Now, I can. Uh, Pointer that I can use here. So uh, basically, the this guideline is spoon plugging in a nutshell. And if if people could take that guideline and try to understand it and study it, uh, they can improve their fishing. There's no question about that. It's how fish react to the environment. That's the first subject we're going to talk about. Is uh, the uh, basic movement of fish. Now, the knowledge of Buck Perry is there. There are eight areas of knowledge. Eight areas of study, whatever you, whatever you call it. The uh, movement of fish, the lake features, the weather and water conditions, the lake types. He classifies lakes as types and how to fish and what type of structure they have in them. Uh, mapping and interpretation, extremely important. Uh, I have up here uh, on uh, a mapping and interpretation uh, thing, if you want to come up and see it afterwards on Macintosh. I just got basically what we do as spoon pluggers is we we study the structure on that lake. We learn it through our trolling. Our lures help us to, to study the form of that structure. And uh, the mapping and interpretation is probably the key to catching fish. It's just like uh, uh, real estate, you know. What's the three most important things with real estate? Location, location, location. Well, with fish too, you've got to be where the fish are. And structure is, the guy, is our guide. Uh, controls and tools. What tools do we use? He doesn't call them lures, he calls them tools because they allow us to control our depth and speed. Presentation of lures and mental attitude. Now, I'm gonna, tonight I'm going to cover basically the movement of fish and uh, the uh, presentation of lures a little bit to give you an idea of what, uh, just kind of a touch in those areas. Uh, let's see. A fishing fact. At some time or other, a fish can be caught by most anyone, most any place, on most anything, and by most any method. But that's not the way we want to do our fishing. 
I mean, all of us have come across, oh, you know, didn't expect to catch a fish, and that can happen. But we want to we want to approach our fishing in a systematic uh, approach. A fishing fact: if you and I expect to catch more and bigger fish, we must spend our time where we have the best chance to catch a fish. That's that's basically where the fishing the location. And it's a fishing guideline that if you and I expect to catch more and bigger fish consistently, we must be at the right place on structure at the right time when the fish move, come active, fishing in the right manner, uh, controlling our depth and speed. Now what is spoon plugging? It's what makes a fish tick and how do I catch it? It's as simple as that. Now we concentrate on the largemouth bass and there's, there's a number of reasons why we concentrate on him. First of all, he's a universal fish. Now you'll notice the walleye is in here and there's perch and all other kinds of species. But the largemouth bass is the one that we concentrate on. And why? Uh, not because we like the largemouth bass the most. It's because he's the universal distribution, and he is the most difficult to catch. Why is he the most difficult to catch? Mainly because he reacts most severely to the weather and water changes, conditions. Bright light, cold fronts, things like that. Uh, he's really the toughest to catch. Becomes the most dormant, you might say, under cold front conditions. <clears throat> We're after the, the what we call the adult bass, from two and a half to three pounds and larger. At, at this size, they school in deep water. Uh, and those are the ones that we're really after. Uh, the smaller fish uh, can tell us where the bigger fish might be, you might say. If we catch a small fish, we always look around the area. Are there some bigger ones hanging out deeper? and on the same structure. And what is, what is that structure? What's the form of it? And that's what we ask ourselves when we catch a, a small fish or any fish, really. <clears throat> Take a lake, and we're going to uh, go over the basic movement of fish. We separate the shallows from the deep water because the uh, fish react differently in the shallows, 8 to 10 feet in shallower, than they do in the deep water, 8 to 10 feet deeper. Where is the home of the fish? The home of the fish is in deep water. We, now we place the, oh, uh, basically maybe I better go, go through that a little bit. The home of the fish is the deep water, uh, basically because we call this a sanctuary. And uh, the sanctuary is, is a stable condition for them. And normally that's 30, 35 feet or deeper. Uh, that can vary with the species, it can vary with the clarity of the water, it can vary with a lot of things. The clearer the water, the deeper the, the sanctuary of the fish. They become active once or twice on a normal fishing day, uh, and uh, uh, once more often in the winter time, once in the middle of the day, in the summertime more often earlier in the morning and later in the afternoon or evening. Uh, I, uh, a couple of items on basic movements, first of all. Deer have pathways for, ba for daily movements. Uh, sometimes they'll go on those pathways all the way, sometimes they'll go half the way, sometimes they don't even get out of their yarding area. Uh, fish are the same way. They, they react to their environment, they have pathways, they, have, they go by structure. Uh, they're the same way. And another thing that maybe we can uh, try to understand animals in their environment, and their natural environment, uh, predator-prey relationships. When you look at, uh, for instance, the Serengeti Plain, you come in over on an airplane and, you, and it's just barren down there and all of a sudden you see a clump of trees and you, you see an airplane's flying in and you see the clump of trees and all around that clump of trees is a bunch of, of uh, grazing animals. Just thousands of them all over in there, but they're kind of in that vicinity. And you go a little closer and who's underneath, it's 110 in the shade. Who's sitting under the shade? The big cats, the predators. They got the best lie. We have to think about fishing in that respect, too. Uh, when the prey, and the, and the prey don't, you know, it's an instinctual thing. But they're basically, they're saying, hey, I'm going to keep an eye on that guy. When he wakes up, I'm getting out of here. And uh, so this is something we have to think about, because this is an instinctual thing with, with both bait fish. You'll notice the bait fish will, will hang around. Uh, the big fish will be in the, in the vicinity often. And uh, when those big fish start getting active, 
those, those bait fish are heading towards the shallows. Why do they go towards the shallows? Because the bigger a fish gets, uh, the older and larger a fish gets, the more reluctant he is to come shallow, into the shallows. And so uh, on a seasonal basis, this can vary. Uh, so there, there's, you know, we're st making statements here that are, as a general rule, true. Uh, but they, you know, there can be exceptions to it in different seasonal things, too. But uh, we have to look at fish as a, a predator-prey relationship and how do they react to things. And the, those big fish are, are the predators, the big bass, the big pike, the big walleye. Uh, those little walleye better get out of there because a 10, 12-pound walleye can gobble up a uh, two-pound walleye like popcorn. So they are not compatible. Okay, basic movement of fish. Uh, sanctuary is 30 to 35 feet because it's stable. And this is the most common structure. We, we talk about structure. Now, Mr. Perry has defined uh, 17 different types of bottom forms in different types of lakes uh, that fish use in their movements and migrations. Uh, it's in his book. Uh, but the bar is the, is the most common structure. And basically, uh, the, uh, there, there's, like I said, there's 17 of them, this is the bar. But when we look at a structure, basically, it extends out into the deep water, and this is just an example. Uh, bars don't always look like that. This is, this is one that uh, most of them don't look like that, but this is a common form, you might say. Basically, it's, it's a change in the bottom that extends out to the deep water and it ends. And then the deep water is just a big bowl. It, there's no, basically, there's no form to it. And so, this is the most common structure. And when the, we talk about basic fish movements, they're in the deep water and then they, they say they start to become active. The fish will move to what we call a contact point, right there. That contact point is where the, the bar starts basically, and that's the first thing the fish see from the deep water, and it's a light change. They can see the, the bottom's a little bit shallower in that area, and all around it's the same depth. They see the tip of that bar because there's a light change there. So that's what they can see, that's what they can go to. Uh, and and they, they become active. They move up now on an excellent day, they might move up into eight to 10 feet. Now normally, uh, that movement is, is very rare when a, a school of adult fish moves into 8 to 10 feet. Weather conditions have to be excellent. And I, I'm not going to get into all the weather situation here because I don't have time, but uh, basically when these fish say they go, the, the school of adult fish uh, comes to the 8 to 10 foot level, the, the small fish are going to precede them into the shallows. So uh, fish are, are, are in the shallows and there are a few of the big fish will go into the shallows. Uh, why do the small fish go on the shells? Because they're going to get eaten if they don't, basically. Now we call this a hot spot. People are catching fish in the shallows. A lot of people don't think about maybe they're catching fish in here, turning around and looking, well, maybe I ought to go just a few feet deeper or go out a little bit or look if, if I knew what the form of that structure was. If I could look in the water and say right down there is the tip of that bar, uh, I better make a cast over there. Uh, that might make a difference. Then, in a short period of time, they're back in the sanctuary. The activity is over. And I, I think all of you are aware of, when you get into fish, uh, into walleye, all of a sudden there's bang, 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 bang. There's a bunch of fish all at once. That's an activity. That's a movement period. Uh, they know if they're in a huge lake of 15 feet here, or how the fish move on the space. Uh, put the fish in the sanctuary. The fish become active. They move up to the base of the weed line. Some fish will move up the weed line and into the weeds, a few of the bigger fish and the smaller fish. We look at the base of the weed line as the area where we want to concentrate our efforts. Now, they can move along that baseline, base of the weed line. But generally, they will contact that weed line at the tip of the point, tip of the bar, tip of the weeds. And, and so those tips are what we have to concentrate on. Again, we call it a hot spot. They're catching fish. Uh, in the shallows, uh, don't forget to check the base of that weed line. How do we fish a lake like this? We've got a shallow lake, it's all choked with weeds and maybe a couple small uh, areas um, where there's some, some open area. 
Uh, where's the home of the fish? Well, it's not in 35 feet because you don't have 35 feet. It's under the weeds. Say these areas are clear, maybe 10, 10 11 feet deep, a uh, couple small clear areas. When the fish become active, the adult fish will move to the edge of the weeds. Now, in most cases, this is a casting situation. And uh, we cast as well as troll. That's, we don't just do the troll, we cast too. And in fact, we catch most of our fish casting when we get into schools. But we, if it's large, you can maybe troll it. But this is what we do in a lake that's clogged with weeds like that. The main basic thing we have to remember is that the home of the fish is deep water. That's extremely important. OK, I'm going to, uh, excuse me here, I'm going to move the slides if I can here to uh, a little presentation. That must be the slide. There we go. Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, presentation of lures. The, uh, there's two ways we can present lures. Basically, uh, either cast or troll. There's a lot of different forms of it, but we can either cast or troll. Uh, they, really, we need to do both to cover all situations. If we just say, I like to troll, you know, well, there's a lot of situations that that casting is the best to do, and vice versa. So uh, both casting and trolling is what we do uh, routinely to, uh, to contact and to, and to arrive at the fish. Uh, trolling is our teacher. And because we're structure fishermen, fishermen and we concentrate on learning the bottom of the lake, each individual structure. We actually draw maps up here, it, um, little pencil drawings of what we have fished. And I, there's an example here on Lake Nakatoa, if you'd like to come up and see it afterwards. But we do that because it puts in our mind the form that's underneath the water. There's a lot of, you can draw your graph and draw pictures and everything, but until you are on the water and you can look over there and say, I need to cast right there, uh, it's difficult to know where you are on the structure. And so what we try to do is, to the, every time we fish a structure, we try to to at least in our mind draw it, maybe not on the water, maybe after we get back home, but uh, get a form of what's on the bottom. The, the lures help us do that. They're a great tool in helping us to map. Casting, uh, we make our best catch, uh, catches casting. If we locate us by trolling, we locate fish. Once you hit a fish, if you continue trolling, you're, you're wasting a lot of time because you're making a turn and you're coming back and you're doing this and that. If you can anchor your boat and cast, you're right on. But you have to control the depth and speed of your lure too. That's part of it. Uh, let's see. These are our basic tools. We first call them spoon plugs. Uh, they are bottom bumping, free running lures. Uh, there's a lot of crankbaits. It's a crankbait, basically. There's a lot of crankbaits out there. Uh, these are the tools that Mr. Perry designed because they do a specific job. Now there's a lot of other tools that you can use for trolling and bumping the bottom and things like that if you want to. There's nothing wrong with that. These are extremely accurate. Uh, each one of these is a, si a series of seven. Each one goes to a specified depth and stays there no matter how fast you go. From one and a half mile an hour up to 10 or more miles an hour. They will stay there. And if you want to double the depth, this one goes two to four, four to six, 6 to 9, 9 to 12, 12 to 15, 15 to 20, and 20 to 25. Now, I, I defy anybody to take that 20 to 25 and try to run 10 miles an hour. You aren't going to do it. But in the shallow water, you can. And the shallower you go, the more active the fish are, as a general rule. They, when they go down deeper, the water's colder. Uh, they're more dormant. They're harder to catch. Probably more live bait situation. Uh, those are the things we have to take into consideration in any way we go. But anyway, these are the tools that we use. And uh, they are extremely accurate. We can tune them to the inch if we want to as we're trolling along. Uh, we want to strain the water from the shallow to the deep, to the deep in a precise and orderly manner. 
First of all, we learn structure, then we locate fish. Uh, let's see. This is a bar here. And again, on our presentation, we want to separate the shallows from the deep, because the fish react differently in the shallows than they do in the deep. We're going to start with our presentation of lures. We're going to take our tool, which, and the lure isn't the only tool. We use a special rod, line, and reel. And the reason we do that is to get the feel. You can, I've got a, a trolling rod up here you can take a look at. Real stiff line, a solid glass, short, four and a half foot uh, rod. We use this to get the feel of the bottom. And the feel of the bottom is very important. In this, in this uh, instance right here. What we're doing is we're taking this section of shoreline. Is there anything here that might catch, might have fish? We're looking at it for the first time. We take the 500, which goes two to four feet. Say we run 60 feet of line out. That means we've probably got two and a half to three feet that lure is running, exactly. We turn towards the shore. When that lure still first starts to bump bottom, we turn away slightly. When that, as we keep going, as that run, lure runs free, we turn slightly again towards the shoreline. We're contour trolling in and out, and that lure is bumping bottom, running free, bumping bottom, running free. Okay, we turn around, and we're, we're still trying to figure out what, what is in this shoreline here. We take the 400, runs 4 to 60. We do the same thing. Now, here, as we go, we're checking our speeds at the same time. We'll speed up, and we'll slow down. And uh, we can, the lure is going to stay at that depth. So we're checking our speed as well as our depth, and we're straining the depth from the shallows all the way down. Take the 400, do the same thing. Now we're starting to see some form here to the bottom. Uh, when you're first learning this, this uh, technique of, of presentation, you're better off to go to a lake like Mankatawa that's real dark, doesn't have any weeds. You start doing this with these lures when there's a lot of weeds, unless you're using markers or something, uh, it's going to be tough. And you get frustrated and you don't want to do it. So, this is the way. This is what we use in in uh, water to learn a uh, learn a lake. But we have to take into consideration. Yeah, there's some there's some uh, limitations there. So anybody that's going to do this, I recommend them gets you know get in a lake that, that you can present and learn how to use the rod and reel and the line. Okay, we got some form here. I better keep going here. Get the slow down a little. Uh, Two fifty goes six to nine feet. Go down the go down there. Now we're really coming out. We've got a bar here. It's sticking way out of the lake towards the deep water. We found structure. This is a, from a top view. What have we done so far? We've covered the shallows and now we got out towards the deep water. Now here's where the shallows differ from the deep water. We've got a structure leading to the deep water and we don't have to go all the way over here and here to fish that now. We got down to 8 to 10 feet. The fish are reacting differently. We want to fish just this area, this structure, or the pathway that those fish make from the deep water to the shallow water. So we take a 200 lure. Uh, that 200 lure goes from uh, 9 to 12 feet. <clears throat> and we, uh, we do what we call straight line passes. We run over that structure bumping bottom. We feel it. We know whether it's sand. We know whether it's gravel. We know whether it's muck. Of course, we want a harder bottom if at all possible. Fish relate more to hard bottom than they do to, uh, to a soft monkey bottom. <clears throat> uh, and most bars are harder than the surrounding areas, a general rule, in the structure, the way the structure is laid out. But we go across it, we turn around, we come back, we bump a couple times. We may want to go down the side, and bump a couple times, come out here, bump, bump a couple times across here. We want to cover that whole air pathway. And at the same time, again, we change our speeds. If those fish are real active, and there's a school of adult fish up there, and they're, they're chasing minnows around lickety split. They aren't going to see my plastic worm down there. They're going to hit something moving. They're active. And so another, the, the reverse of that is if they're real dormant, they aren't going to see my spoon plug, or they aren't going to be able to catch up with it. And so we got to check both fast and slow speeds. Anyway, we're trolling now. We're trying to cover this. And we take the 100 lure out, do the same thing with it. It goes on, uh, 12 to 15 feet. We covered this structure down to 15 feet. And in the shallows, the 8 to 10 feet, we've covered all this water. And then in, in the uh, deeper than that, we covered just the bottom, basically. The fish uh, are found, relate to the bottom more in the, in the deeper water than they do in the shallow water, basically. 
How do we do a weed line? Basically, we stack up the weed line. Again, this is a little tougher, but we use markers. I got a sample of uh, kind of kind of markers we like. Well, that's a nice marker here. Buck does have those available. There's other kinds of markers that are good too. Uh, I don't like to use a lot of them. I use maybe one, maybe two at the most, and then concentrate in that area. You don't want to lay them all over and, and get in the way of other fishermen. If you're, if you're fishing one spot, hey, throw a marker out and then fish around it and get, get out of it. But uh, the markers are very helpful because they help you picture what's down there. Uh, but it, on a point of a weed bar, yeah, use, use some markers help you in your trolling pass. Now say we've covered this down to the 100, and then we stop and say, well, we fished that now. Is that really true? Not necessarily. Those fish could have come up to the 20-foot the contour, which is the contact point on this structure. Maybe on another end of the side of the lake, the contact point was, a, uh, was shallower. But here, where the structure goes down to 20 feet, we got to fish all the way down to where that's, the structure ends, what we call a contact point. Uh, those fish could have moved up, become active right here, and uh, 15 minutes, turn around going back. We missed them. We trolled all that. So what else do we do now? Well, we can troll it more thoroughly with deeper lures, and we can cast it. <clears throat> so we can cast uh, lure out, out over here, cast the shallows, fan, what we call fan casting because we're covering this whole area. We know this is the, this is the general area that we want to concentrate our fishing on be in the, in the plants where the place where we have the best chance to catch a fish, as Buck says. Uh, and so we will cast it. We'll cast it with spoon pugs, and we'll cast it with uh, jump lures, a jig. Uh, there's a lot of different, you can use all kinds of stuff. Put a, put a minnow on a jig, you can put, uh, we like the little heavier equipment sometimes because it allows us to fish it a little faster. Uh, in the summertime, in the wintertime, when they're cold weather, it's slow, yeah, we gotta go down slow. You know? Small jigs, live bait, whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, oh, we've got to go back here. We've got one more. There we go. Okay, say we had a fish on the troll. And the spoon plug is a great casting bait. And it's, it's a crankbait. <clears throat> when we hit a fish on a troll, on a structure, first thing we do is throw a marker out. Towards the, towards the shoreline, hopefully. Uh, we know that if we got 60 feet of line out, that fish is 60 feet behind the boat. We got that school pinpointed pretty much. And we know how deep the school is, because where the lure was traveling at, say, it's a 14 foot, it was running at 14 foot. Okay, behind the 60 foot, approximately, we can go back and we can estimate where that school was. Now, on any large fish, fish three pounds and over, you catch in water deeper than eight to 10 feet. The chances are great that he's with other fish in size. Uh, they do school in deep water, pretty much all species. Uh, okay, so you go back and you anchor as shallow as possible. Anchor at eight, uh, eight, eight feet. You can cast a 100 spoon plug, which goes 12 to 15 feet. It's a, it's a middle, uh, <coughs> middle size right, right there. And Cast it out, let it sink. It's a sinking lure, it's not a floating lure. That, that's an advantage in this type of presentation. Uh, goes all the way down to the bottom. Tighten your line, lower your rod tip, and start cranking. You're doing a cranking bit. Now that lure, you cast it out down to the bottom, it will bump bottom all the way back to the boat. If you're anchored in eight, eight feet or less than that. Now say you're anchored in 10 or 12 feet, you might use the 700, a little deeper lure. Anything deeper than 12 feet, you're not going to keep a spoon plug on the bottom. So we anchor shallow and cast deep. Uh, these fish, if you if you get a, a fish school <coughs> into a school of fish that's in, in a feeding frenzy, so to speak, uh, they're just like chickens. You feed chickens, you know, they're coming after you. They just kind of fight for it. And a lot of you guys have caught two fish. I know <laughs> Bill Riley caught two walleye once <laughs> over in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, well, where was it? We were on the Detroit River. I Detroit got River. Two on a uh, number 11 Rapala. Two on a number 11 Rapala. Those fish fight for these things if they're in a frenzy. And so you want to be ready for them. That was the funniest thing I ever saw. No, Bill could do it if anybody could do it. But I'm sure you've had an experience where you caught two fish on one, or, or, or you bring one in and the other one's kind of fighting, uh, trying to grab the lure from them. That's just their nature. That, that's a, a, an active school. You're in an active school. So anyway, you, 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 you need to 
increase your speed. If you have two casters, you get you can get more fish out of that school. Uh, and it's it may only be five minutes or ten minutes. That school is there and active, so you don't have a lot of time to turn around, make another trolling pass, and all that. Uh, you, you're more efficient if you can anchor and get to it. Now you don't always get to them. You say, oh, I'm anchored the wrong spot, or I can't control my depth and speed. It's too deep. Then then you've got a problem, and you might be better off going for it. Uh, so there's there's a lot of depending on the structure. There's a lot of factors involved. This is the most exciting thing in fishing for me. The ultimate goal of a spoon plugger is to get into a school of adult fish and catch them on consecutive casts. Uh, uh, especially smallmouth, but you know, other fish too. Uh, it's, it's, it's just great. They leave you shaking in your boots. Uh, when the action stops, if you sit and wait a few minutes, cast again, if there's no action, go to a jump lure. Do your, do your fan casting. You cast out. Uh, covering the area, they may have moved to the side, they may have moved uh, deeper, uh, they may have moved down the brake line. Check that too. Uh, hop it, and then when the, when the jump lure, uh, jig, whatever, uh, is sinking, that's when they're going to get it. Uh, let's see, let's see. This is just relates to the fact, say you're in a school of, of three pounders, are you going to leave that school? And the largest and the most uh, largest fish are the most reluctant to come shallow. Uh, are you going to leave that and go go to looking for a bigger fish? But he's probably there. It's something to ponder. But I wouldn't leave a school of big fish and, uh, looking for a bigger one. I, I go after him. Trouble begins here. 15 feet. This is where control of our lure, depth and speed, especially depth. Is very difficult. You can hit in the shallows if you troll in, in uh, eight feet of water. Uh, you're making a trolling pass. You can come right across to a, a, a white plate or whatever down on the bottom. There, Pardon? Your sound and your voice thing has been lost. I think the battery's oh, probably dead. Okay. Is that okay? Can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, the uh, did I turn it off? No, I think probably the battery went dead oh, on you, okay. Chase. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try to speak up a little bit. Uh, but the, uh, let's see, what was I saying? Okay, well, anyway, now we'll get into, this is my daughter, and uh, she loves to go fishing with me, but she wants me to make sure I can say, maybe you guys can teach me something, because there's, uh, that's one way to get, but bass uh, are a lot of fun to get into a school, and, and these are all, all these are from, within an hour drive of Grand Rapids, and they, uh, we released them all. Uh, basically, you're catching fish in a short period of time, you keep them in the live well, you keep your live, your pump going, and then you put them on the stringer for 30 seconds, lift them up, take a picture, and you got them, and you release them. Uh, we don't, I don't eat, well, I eat some fish, but I don't eat a lot, we release most of the fish that we catch. Uh, it's an important resource. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's a ball catching them like this. This is from the Grand River downtown. Uh, that's Jack Clark over here. And we got into a bunch of catfish. And these were jump lures, these were not spoon plugs, but most of the other ones, uh, we caught a lot of them on spoon plugs. But whatever it takes, whatever the speed is. Uh, there's, uh, I did keep one, this fish here is a steelhead, I did keep that, I love to eat steelhead. Uh, that's about a four pound smallmouth. We got into a school of smallmouth the same afternoon. Uh, those were up to about 10 pounds, 8, eight 10 pounds worth of yeah. But uh, just, you're just having a ball. It's really fun. It's really fun. This is Carl Maltz, who is the uh, uh, contributing, contributing editor of Fishing Facts magazine. Excellent spoon plugger. Uh, we have at Fisherman's Landing, the Lunker Hunters uh, uh, have a spoon plugging network outing, and pretty much all the Clubs, the spoon plugging clubs from around the Midwest, uh, join us. We go fishing. We uh, a lot of food and fellowship, and you learn a lot from these guys. Uh, you guys are welcome to come down. We have it in the middle of July. I think it's around July 16th or no, 12th, 13th, something like that this year. You're welcome to join us and, and uh, see what we do. And, and we have food and fellowship. Just a great time. Uh, this is a friend from uh, Alabama. 
but I met up in Carbondale, Illinois at one of our other outings and, and uh, we got uh, got some nice fish that weekend. I uh, learned a lot from this guy, he's a good fisherman. Uh, it's, it's really, a, we have a great time. Uh, this is some of uh, Mr. Perry's material. Basically, I wouldn't say, I'm going to recommend not to buy Mr. Perry's spoon plugs right away. If you want to get into it, get the green book. I've got a sample up here for you to look at it. That's, the, that's basically what that is, is the directions for the tools. How to use them, why he uses them, uh, why he presents them in a certain manner. Uh, this is the, uh, an expanded, and I have a sample up here too of this, expanded nine <coughs> volume study series that uh, is an expanded of this book, expansion of the book. This is a lifetime learning bunch of material that, that you can use for a lifetime. I've read this book 10 or 12 times or more. Every time I read it, I get more out of it. And then I go and experience it on the water, and I come back and I read the book. Again, or read a part of the book or something. It's, it's tremendous what information is in there. It's, it's really uh, hard, to, hard to believe. Uh, the, let's see, I, I had a couple things here that I wanted to, uh, just a few walleye pointers, and then we'll stop. But this is, uh, I took this from, from Buck's, uh, Buck Curry's book on spoon fighting. And these are just a couple things that he mentions in his book about walleye. Uh, walleye use structure like all fish. Look for large, deep, rather flat underwater bars and humps in the summertime. 30 to 50 foot depths may be indicated. Work break lines on top and deeper water around these structures. Base break lines can be especially productive. The walleye is normally a slower fish, especially during early season. They are often found in deep, clear, cold water lakes where live bait and slow speeds are indicated. However, in the warmer season and dingy waters, crankbait trolling speeds can be very fast. The fastest I caught a walleye going was close to 10 miles an hour. It surprised me too, but uh, you can't understand. That, that's a certain situation. Warm water, active fish, I just happened to luck out of it. You don't always catch me, I guess, but most of the time you don't, you just hold it with me. But uh, don't be afraid to check it out, basically. The walleye is one of the first game fish species to become active after a cold front passes. Walleye will take a light ticking lure more readily than a hard walking lure. To catch a largemouth bass, you need to have that lure bumping bottom. To, uh, for walleye, if you can just tick the bottom occasionally, uh, if they're more effective for walleye. So we, we take that into account depending on the waters we're fishing. If weeds go to 20 feet or more, check the lake for nighttime movements. Walleye, muskie, and northern can be caught on a troll spoon plug down to 60 feet, whereas bass only to about 35 feet. Walleye are affected by light slightly more than other species, and their movements usually are not as shallow. Walleyes have a migrating nature. Seasonal migrations can be 90 miles or more. They will not use the same structure all season, but will move around the lake system using the structure in the area where they are. As a result, when walleye are found, considerable time should be spent checking structure in the area thoroughly with all depths and speeds. Heavy boat traffic can result in walleye nighttime movements. Seasonal movements in a natural lake are much more restrictive than in a reservoir. Walleye, northern, and muskie often suspend off structure after migration and will take a free running lure below 8 to 10 feet if presented correctly. Often they suspend 10 to 15 feet horizontally off the break line at its depth. Depth control is very important here. A walking lure coming off the brake line has much more accurate depth control than a free-running lure onto it. When walleye action slows or stops, always check deeper on the structure as the commotion may have caused the fish to drop down the structure. Deeper. Sandy bars, brake lines, and humps can be productive for walleye in the summer. Uh, I'd like to finish with one quote from Buck Perry's book. Spoon plugs have their place. They eliminate no lure in your tackle box. They just make all the others more valuable. That's it. Any questions? You usually hold on the wire. 
Pardon? Do, do you usually pull your spoon plug on a wire? No. Uh, depending on the depth that you're trying to fish, uh, the uh, uh, the wire is uh, used for ex ex deeper conditions, but our fish are much more easy to catch with the shallow. And so we always start in the shallows and we work down deeper. If we have them, the fish aren't active, uh, we're going to go down to wire. And if the structure goes down, we're going to wander around in the, in the lake, uh, bottom of the lake, you know, looking for, for walleye or for structure. We, we have to know that structure down there before we put the wire on. But it will double the depth uh, of these lures. And it's a little tricky to get used to at first. I don't have a wire reel here, but it's a, the, the wire, there's a little wire that holds these spoon plugs on here. It's a Monel solid stainless steel Monel wire. It's a smooth wire. It's not a, a ribbed wire. It doesn't cut your, your uh, ferrules as much, or very much at all, really. But it's a little tough to use. You really need to, to understand and, and practice with the uh, Mono, monofilament first, and then the wire. But it can be very effective, and, and for deeper, deeper water work, it's great. There's nothing, there's nothing, uh, even in Lake Michigan we use it. There's nothing out there that you can take a lure without any weight on it and go down to 50 to 60 feet and bump bottom and feel the bottom with wire and a, and a big spoon plug you can. I've caught, I've only caught fish down to 45 feet in Lake Michigan, but uh, that was a 27-pound king. And when you hit that wire line. I bought lost my rod, and uh, they can they can really suck. Why are you got to be a little careful? Yeah. And have you experimented like with fire line? And I not, have. Not, no stretch line. You get the same kind of depth. Or uh, you, you can get more depth with it. The problem with it is that uh, Mr. Perry has has <laughs> developed in his system that the resistance of the line is part of the system. Uh, we use a very quite a heavy line, 17 pound mile film. Now, when you increase your speed, the lure dives down deeper, but the, the resistance of the line pulls it back up, and so you keep your same speed. This is my interpretation. Of it. Probably he's an engineer and he knows all about that. But I, uh, this is my understanding of what what happens is that it's all. If you put a fire line on and you want to hit uh, 25 feet uh, and just tick the bottom lightly, you want that lure to stay at 25 feet, and you want to just tick the bottom. If you put on fire lights, it's going to go down, it's going to keep banging and going deeper. If you put on a spoon plug with proper uh, line and proper depth, you're going to go and you're going to be able to tick bottom. So there's a lot of times that we'll be fishing in a reservoir with a lot of wood on it. We want to hit 18 feet right above, tick the tops of that. We'll, we'll take the, the equipment and we know which lure goes down to what depth and how, much, how many feet of line out. We'll take it down a few more feet. We can tick the top of that. It's, it's extremely accurate. Definitely. So you got regular dive charts with these then? Basically what you're using? Dive charts? Well, where it's so many feet back, it gets you down to a certain depth. These yeah, right here, two to four feet. It's in the book. Yeah, it's in the book. Yeah, he's got it in the book. Yeah. But, I mean, you go two to four feet. If you got 60 feet out, it goes two feet. If you got 80 feet out, it may go three feet. Yeah. 90 feet out, it may go three and a half feet. You know, it's, it's that accurate. And then you can change the speed, and, and that will maintain the depth. So it's really very accurate. Precision trolling is that's what that's all about. That book, uh, and uh, Buck was the first, uh, you know, one to do the precision trolling, and, and that's important. That's extremely important. Be able to put your lure right where you want. It. Any other questions? All right. If there's no more questions for Chase. Thank you very much.